So what do we do about this? How do we mitigate this risk? This is the Cisco attack continuum, also known as the before, during, and after model, also known as the BDA model. Cisco, uh, ever since they've started to acquire security companies to make themselves into the fantastic security company they are today, uh, put this model together to emphasize, first thing they will come out and say that other uh, companies that provide security products are not so willing to say is you cannot eliminate risk. You cannot remove the risk and say, I'm not going to get malware. I'm not going to get ransomware. There will be no intrusions. That's not realistic. It is more realistic to say that all we can do is mitigate risk, reduce our risk. So all of them say they mitigate risk. The difference is the efficacy. How effective are they mitigating the risk? And that's what you're investing in. And when it really, when it comes down to it, think of anything else where you sort of get what you pay for. If you buy an economy car, you're going to have an economy car. If you buy a luxury car, you'll have a luxury car. And that luxury car has its benefits that the economy car does not have. Right? Maybe that's a poor example, but you get the idea. So the before, during, and after model um, is such that Cisco says they're still going to do their best efforts before to try to control and enforce and harden to prevent attacks from permeating. They're also going to watch so that if something gets through the defenses, they can catch it in the act. And they can detect, block, and defend. But here's the part that's unique to Cisco, is that they also have this after phase where they're going to admit some things may get through. And when they find out that it has happened, they still have the ability to scope, contain, and remediate. And then the lessons learned are passed on to the previous phases to mitigate it from happening again. Right? So this after phase is a concept that other companies just don't have. They just don't have this. And it applies really across all, all of your platforms. Your, ne your, you know, your network infrastructure, your endpoint, mobile, virtual, and your cloud infrastructure, this model applies to everything. And Cisco have been, for all of their security products, they fall somewhere on this model, oftentimes in multiple places. So let's start first with DNS security with a side of web security. And I say that because web security is a term that everybody understands. And DNS security seems a little funny at first, and let me explain. Web security is usually typically accomplished through the use of a proxy, right? You got a machine here that is surfing the web on behalf of the original requester. Uh, think of a CEO that has an administrative assistant. The CEO comes in and says, uh, please uh, put to together a, go to the web and put together a report that shows me where our stocks are today. Okay? Um, you know, he or she puts that report together, gives it to the CEO. The administrative assistant was the proxy for the CEO. Right? He or she went out and got that information for him. He didn't do it himself. So the problem with a web proxy now is that, A, they're difficult to administer oftentimes. And they can't handle everything. Um, originally, you know, HTTP traffic was TCP port 80, and HTTPS was TCP port 443, all good and fine. When you use those ports to do something other than they were originally intended to do, that's what confuses proxy servers. For example, streaming video over those. Proxy doesn't know what to do with it, so it, it dies. You have to go into the proxy and say, you know, bypass this traffic. Well, so you poked a hole. For anything that doesn't want to cooperate with the proxy server, you generally will bypass the proxy, which is poking a hole and allowing you know, those vulnerabilities out. Um, so third thing with that is there are only so many protocols that a proxy can protect. You know, HTTP, HTTPS, some of them do FTP, maybe a handful of other ones. But not everything. What about all the other ports? Uh, there are time. DNS security, on the other hand, if you think about it, anything going to the web, or nearly everything going to the web, is going to have to turn a fully qualified domain name into an IP address before it can start, you know, the internet talks in IP addresses. It doesn't talk in fully qualified domain names. So there has to be a mechanism for converting or translating fully qualified domain names to IP addresses. DNS, the same DNS that's been around since the, you know, since the inception of all of this, of the web. That allows right away, before even any traffic is passed, uh, for something to step in and say, what is this resolving to? Uh, no, that's on the bad list, so you're out of there. So if in the case of Cisco, Cisco's Umbrella, which uh, was a company acquired OpenDNS, I don't know, a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, maybe more. 
Um, if the request ends up going to Cisco's umbrella public uh, resolvers, then there are policies, just like any other web policies, that can say, no, this falls into this category, this falls into that category, static categories, just like all other web security solutions do. But uh, Umbrella also offers quite a bit of dynamic um, security in such a way that it can say, well, this area has been distributing malware. This subnet as a whole has been distributed. You know, it can get a little more deep and give you more to the more dynamic what's going on right now instead of static categories. So the reason why that's important is if you see this chart, you can see C2 again, that's C2, CNC, ransomware, uh, or botnet rather, um, that a lot of these oh, will utilize DNS and they need DNS in order to function. So. DNS security can be really one of your first lines of defense, if not the first line of defense. Because again, before you can even take off, before you can start from your, the originating host, you have to resolve that domain name to an IP address before you can get going. Right, so in the case of ransomware, let's talk about how DNS security can step in. Um, you know, we've got compromised websites and we've got our phishing spam, either way. Uh, it has to resolve the address before it can go out and pull down the, the uh, exploit kit, right? So it has to go to the web. If it's Umbrella, Umbrella can say, no, that's, I know this site's distributing exploit kits, so we're going to shut it down there. Let's say it gets past that, right? Remember, we're keeping, we're keeping real about this and understanding that you cannot prevent everything. You can only mitigate risk. So let's say it gets past that and they download it. It's installed the command and control, and now the command and control is, is uh, remotely told to go and download this key for encryption. Again, that has to use DNS to resolve from the malicious infrastructure where this key is hosted, gives it another chance to stop it. Uh, and finally, before the final step before it gets going, it's going to redirect them to a web page where it tells them how to remediate. And again, that needs to use DNS. So there are several several places here in steps where just Umbrella can mitigate that. So just to wrap up Umbrella, I think Umbrella is one of your best bangs for your buck, if you, if you will, for mitigating a, a wide variety of threats, not just web security, but including web security. From there, let's move on to file security. So, you know, that's just kind of a generic term for antivirus, anti-malware and such. Cisco's AMP really is a technology, and this technology is uh, not only just for endpoint, but uh, you know, like uh, your traditional antivirus or anti-malware. It also can run on a number of different platforms, uh, network infrastructure equipment, firewalls, uh, web security solutions, email security solutions, growing number of products. And what AMP's methodology is, is, is does the same, you know, this is just like the BDA model. It's, first it will check to prevent when it first sees a file, the file is introduced, it'll take that file and do a SHA-256 on it and say, do I have this on my list? Is it good, bad, or unknown? And if it's unknown, then it says, all right, well, now I'm going to do a cloud lookup to the AMP cloud, which I'll talk about here in a minute, to Telos. Say, send me the disposition of this file. Here's its signature. The cloud will come back with disposition, good, bad, or unknown. If it's unknown, then you can take that file and it can send it up to ThreatGrid where it can take it apart and do uh, a good number of things on it to find out what its disposition is, good or bad. Report that back to the AMP cloud so the next person on the planet who uses AMP technology looks up that file. Now somebody's already done the, the, the work for that, and it's done. So that's just, just think about that as a technology more so than just a product. Yeah, so the, the, so the advantage of that is when files come in, um, your traditional antivirus will have just two dispositions. It's either known bad, where it drops it or quarantines it, or unknown, and then it lets it go and forgets about it, and you don't ever see it again. It's off the radar. Um, AMP will continuously, well, that's all good and fine until you have a file that sits idle for six weeks and then triggers. And then it's already gotten past the gates for your point in time antivirus. And it, it, you know, it triggers, and you wonder, well, how did this happen? Well, AMP tracks all these files, tracks the movements of all of the files, however they've been renamed, whatever they've spawned, on every system, wherever AMP's installed. So you've got a, a, you know where this file came from originally. And it can also, if it find out that someone, again, on the planet who has, uh, who has AMP installed, has found this file that was originally uh, had a benign disposition 
finds out later, no, no, this file is malware, then it can retrospectively go out and say, okay, here's this, you have this file on all these workstations, and even though they're not being acted upon, they're just sitting idle, it has the ability to go out there and grab those files and quarantine them. So that's something that other antivirus just don't do, and that's very powerful, and that is really just scraping the tip of what AMP does. Again, so it's continuous analysis and retrospective security is that ability to go and say, uh, well, let's, let's find this file. I know it passed, but it, I know where it is right now. Even if it's got a new name or it spawned a few more files, I'm going to grab that file and quarantine it. Okay. Um, there is a device trajectory and a file trajectory feature to AMP for endpoints where you can, on a given endpoint, know uh, for each file, everything that it's done to the file system, wherever it's touched registry, any of the actions that it's done within the scope of that endpoint. File trajectory lets you know where, which endpoints throughout your entire enterprise have this particular file, which is a great way of tracking to find the origin or um, patient, patient zero, if you will, um, to try to trigger it down. All right, so this is an interesting, when a new malware is introduced, the average time for uh, most antivirus or anti-malware is 100 days. So a lot of damage can be done in 100 days. Um, and for endpoints, it's 13 hours.